Good morning, beloved community. Um, my name is Catherine Prather. I am one of the members here, although not officially a leader. I like to pretend that I am. Um, and I am doing the welcome here today because our uh, brave and fearless leader, Maddie Henderson Herlong, is out today. Um, but I hope that despite how tough this week seemed for everyone across campus, you've made it through. You're here now. You can breathe. And we'll, you know, take a moment to reset, to reconnect with God, and then prepare to see whatever this last week before fall break, fall break is next week, <laughs> um, brings us. Our preacher today is our very own Jaun Ku. Uh, Jaun is a third year Master of Divinity student at Candler School of Theology and is serving on in the beloved community as our chaplain in residence. Um, this is her second year and she is highly enjoying this community. Um, her hobby is playing with her roommate's dog, Callie, and teaching Callie Korean. Now, Callie can understand sit, lay down, give a hand, and stand up in Korean. So, claps for Callie. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Testing one, two, one, two. All right. So we're going to do something a little different today. We're going to do this first song, and then voices is going, some of the voices members here, we're going to sing our second song. good and your mercy endure it forever Lord you are good and your mercy endure it forever people from every nation people from every nation and time from generation to generation we would worship you hallelujah hallelujah we Say that again, we worship you. We worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you for who you are. Beginning. You are good. Here we go. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endure forever. People from every nation, people from every nation, and from generation to generation, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. We worship you. We worship you. We're going to end it on this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you. Say that again. We worship you. We worship you. We worship. We worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you. One more time. Do you? One more time. We worship. We worship. You. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are, for you are good, for you are good. Thank you so much. Y'all may be seated for a second. Come on up here, Thomas. Stay over here, Mercedes. Thank you, Bennett. On this one, you can, you can just put my name for the meditation if you want, Bennett. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay, here we go. We will never move and we will never move until you lead the way. decisions Good morning, beloved community. Good morning. The first reading will be taken from Job chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day, the heavenly beings came to present, present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to the accuser, Where have you come from? The accuser answered the Lord from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to the accuser, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then the accuser answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that the man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to the accuser, Very well, he is in your power. Only spare his life. So the accuser went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome swords on Job from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we, receive good, shall we receive good from God and not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite y'all to pray with me. Dear Lord, it's such a blessing to be gathered here today. We pray that this service will be a break from all that is happening in the world. 
I know that many of us have midterms coming up and papers to write. Lord, let us feel confident and prepared for these. We also know that tomorrow is October 7th, a deeply painful day for the world, an extremely emotional and painful day for so many here on this campus. Lord, we pray that humanity can prevail. We pray that peace may come and that good people will no longer lose their lives in the escalation of this tragic war. Lord, we pray for our home here in Atlanta. We know that over 100,000 people had to leave their homes knowing that the air they breathed wasn't safe. We pray that those hurt by this catastrophic fire may recover quickly. God, we pray for those affected by Hurricane Helene. I'm an Appalachian man, and I have seen my home completely devastated by the storm. Some of the towns I grew up around entirely wiped out, friends who've been trapped in their homes and colleges without food, water, and electricity. Lord, we pray that the communities in the Big Bend area of Florida may also swiftly recover. We pray for the thousands in East Georgia without power. We pray for the homecoming of the hundreds missing in Appalachia. We pray for the hundreds who lost their lives in this tragic storm. This has been an incredibly different, difficult week for so many in this community and the world. Lord, most of all, we pray for peace. Let your love shine through us and let us be a shining light for others in these hard times. All these things we pray in your holy name. Amen. Now for a bit of a lighter moment, it's time for the passing of the peace. This is time where we'll all get up and get to know each other a little bit. It's a little bit midterm season, so obviously a stressful time, so we can break up the peace with it by making some new friends. So go ahead, get up, meet each other.
Good morning, everyone. Today, the second reading is from Mark 10, 2 to 16. Some, testing him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to, 
for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly God, help me to be faithful to your word and what you want me to say today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for reading today's scripture. The text is quite challenging, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before we uh, diving into it, I'd like to start with a little lighthearted mood story. So this past week, despite, uh, despite the severe insomnia, I had some joyous uh, moments with my roommate because Brooke, one of my roommates, was on a church trip and so we, can, we could take care of her dog named Kelly. <laughs> so Kelly is a one-year-old pup. She's really cute. She is so smart and understands both English and Korean, as Catherine introduced. <laughs> but the problem is she is so young, has a lot of energy, and quite big. She is taller than my knee, so quite, quite tall. So when she gets exciting, it is really not easy to calm her down. Bless you. <laughs> She is supposed to receive training soon to become a service dog, so I ask for your prayer. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we really seriously need a prayer. Kelly is the dog I have lived with in my lifetime. I used to live with cats in Korea, but living with a dog is a whole different experience. The most surprising thing to me is dogs have almost no me time. Cats are busy doing whatever they want. They groom, eat, like catch mice, and some bath. However, Kelly always follows us around, asking for a play. Sometimes, even when I go to bed for a nap, she barks at me to stay with her. It's, it's so cute, but it's really kind of a hassle. She makes me happy, but she also makes me feel guilty. While Kelly have no class, assignment, or big worries, we have, and I have, plenty things to do. I have to go to school, have to do assignments, meet people, and do chores. So I sometimes have to ignore Kelly's asking for play with her. My roommates understand why I cannot always reply to Kelly with kindness, but she has no idea because she's not that busy as us. It sometimes worries me that she might feel rejected. Despite that, Kelly always wants my love, wags her tail, stays by my side, and if I don't play with her, she just step back, like, yeah, step back and come back whenever I call her again. Now I understand why people really like dogs. Yeah. Our lives are not so different from those of a dog. Just like those cannot fully understand our busy lives, we cannot fully comprehend God and the world around us. But unlike dogs, we get upset whenever we get rejected, injured, or fail unexpectedly. Sometimes we lose our direction, motivation, and wonder. The book of Job responds to such frustrations. Job chapter one, verse one says, Job was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. 
all of these characteristics are emphasized in the Hebrew Bible. In particular, Proverbs states that those who live in li righteously will surely be awarded by God. However, in Job chapter 2, his righteousness led to an, an unexpected outcome. It's a tragedy. Job's faithfulness sparks a debate between God and the accuser about Job's motives for being faithful to God. And God and the accuser agree to test Job's faith, and Job suffers severe pain without doing anything wrong. He suffers from painful sores all over his body. I mean, three weeks ago, I had hives on my left hand, like all on my left hand, that made sleep impossible. And I can hardly imagine the suffering if, if these hives covers all of my body. And in fact, Job laments in Job chapter 3, verse 3, saying, let the day perish in which I was born. Many readers are really shocked by this unfair outcome of his faithfulness. In particular, they wonder how God could allow a righteous person to suffer morally for a debate with the accuser. However, we must remember that this is not about the explanation of the reality, but it is the response to it. We know the reality. The reality is that all righteous people get not get rewarded, nor are all wicked people punished. In other words, we acknowledge that life is unfair and suffering is beyond our comprehension. The ancient Israelites firmly believed that those who did good would be rewarded and those who do evil would be punished. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 16 to 20 says, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, you shall be live and become numerous. But if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient to God, you shall certainly perish. This belief solidified that those who prosper do so because they are righteous, and those who suffer do so because they are evil. Even though, as we know, it is always not the case. In fact, even though we do not read today, but in the middle of the part of the book of Job, Job's friends criti criticize Job just because he is suffering, suggesting that God must be punishing you because you did something wrong. Contrary to Job's friends and against the common beliefs of ancient Israel, this story was written to respond to those who suffer without reasons and those who are stigmatized for their suffering. The story does not exist to claim that God is so petty that we suffer for no reason. This story declares that our suffering is not our fault. Because this love of God is fully revealed in the story of Job, even though Job is not a person from Israel, he's from Uz, his story was included in the Hebrew Bible. Despite this suffering, Job did not lose faith in God. Instead, he stood up to his, to his friends who unjustly accused him and pleading to God to prove him innocent. Eventually, God never ignored him. God shows up and declares Job to be innocent. This story tells us two things. It is not their fault the weak suffer, and God is always with them. We also find God's care for those who suffer without no reason in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 10, verses 2 to 12, describes a debate between Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees ask Jesus, it is lawful for a man to divorce his wife? They weren't really asking if divorce was permissible. They already knew that Moses permitted a man to um, break, like write a certificate of divorce and send his wife away. Therefore, their question was about what is a legitimate reason for a man to break up with his wife? In fact, this question was to interrupt Jesus. King Herod, who ruled Galilee during the time of Jesus, divorced his wife at this time. 
He was divorced because he was attracted to his brother's wife, Herodias, and he abandoned his original wife. So, if Jesus has said, divorce resulting from infidelity is not permitted, then Jesus would have been politically persecuted by Herod. This was the outcome the Pharisees wanted to happen. However, this question reflects the deeply rooted, violent, patriarchal family system of the Israelite society. It implies that only a husband could declare divorce. Also, the question never considers the shame and suffering divorced women would face. When a woman got divorced in Jesus' day, she lost almost everything, including the right for her property. Therefore, divorced women often had to beg for food or turn to prostitution to survive. Many women suffered unjustly because of this unfair system. However, the parasites who do know the law so much were so focused on entrapping Jesus that they weren't aware of how this divorce system hurt their community itself. So Jesus refused to answer the parasites' question directly. Moses divorce, law, Moses divorce law is an exception, recognize that promises between people cannot be always be perfect. But it does not mean divorce is the ideal or desirable outcome for a married couple. Therefore, instead, Jesus explains the intent of God based on the book of Genesis. In verses 6 to 9, Jesus says, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Through this response, Jesus teaches that the idol for marriage is not separation, but becoming a full oneness. Jesus' answer prevented the escalation of unjust divorces that caused innocent women to suffer even more. And his response continued to teach us that honoring and keeping promises with the vulnerable is the, in line with God's will. Mark chapter 10 verses 13 to 16 has a similar teaching. Many people brought their children to Jesus in this story. Perhaps the parents were so moved by Jesus caring for the vulnerable, and they might want to um, bring their, the most vulnerable member, family member, their children, to Jesus and get blessed by him. However, the disciple rebuked those who broke the children. Perhaps they thought it was more imperative to protect Jesus from any potential danger. It sounds like Jesus is a celebrity with bodyguards, like blocking fans. But angry, Jesus rebuked his disciples. He said, let the children come to me. Do not stop them. Jesus was furious at the disciples' actions. He came to bring the kingdom of God to earth where unjust structure disappear and all people and creations are healed. So caring for the weak is really important task for Jesus. And children were among the most vulnerable people during his times. In Israelite society, children were physically weak, mentally immature, and lacked legal property rights. If a family were torn away by divorce, they would be left without a means of survive. They represent the suffering people we see in Job, and in the former story in Mark. These children is God's protection. So they approach Jesus with full trust. They need Jesus to survive, and they came to earth, they, and Jesus came to earth to be with them. Yet, shockingly, we are witnessing that the disciples are not letting the kids come to Jesus. Jesus was, of course, outraged. He declared firmly, the kingdom of God belongs to children like this. So Jesus welcomed the children who came to him first. He embraced them and blessed them. In Jesus' blessing, the children could feel God's love and peace. Our life is so complicated. 
we may fail at things we hope to be succeed at. Minor misunderstandings might separate us from people who really wanted to know for a long time. Our well-detailed plans may suddenly fall apart because of a health issue. Despite our best efforts, we sometimes become broken, we sometimes become weak and suffering. Whenever something bad happens, we want to cry like a child. Yet, to Job who cries, to women who are about to get be divorced, to children who are rejected, and to us who are frustrated, God speaks. Don't blame yourself for what happening to you. It's just that it is a complicated and unfair world. God always has our back. All we have to do is acknowledge our weakness, trust God, and take another step. As Kelly trusts me and keep loving me. So please take a look at the people around you. Mm -hmm. And together, let's say, it's okay to be weak. <laughs> yeah, especially in this middle of midterm. It's okay to be weak. <laughs> it's okay to be cry. It's okay to be suffered. On the other hand, some of us have already cried and received healing and comfort to God. To us, Jesus says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. So we must not forget those moments when we were weak. Just because we are strong now, we must not become like the Pharisees or the friends of Job's. We need to care for the vulnerable people around us, especially those in the beloved community. So please welcome their vulnerability and offer the care they need. The key thing is to be with, uh, to be with them at the same eye level, just as Jesus embraced and blessed children at the same eye level. So let's look into the eyes of the person next to each other. Kind of really cheesy, but. <laughs> so I bless us all to become like little children, acknowledging our weakness and relying on God's strengths so that our beloved community can become a community full of love and respect. Amen.
Um, today I'm going to be reading the prayers of the people. So whenever I say, Lord, in your mercy, respond with, hear our prayer. So let us pray. Dear God, thank you for all the beautiful people of beloved community. It is a blessing that we have all gathered here in the same moment to celebrate you, even with the struggle of midterms and meetings piling up. As exams come and go, help us bring strength and knowledge to power through and guide us to peace in our lives once the bulk has passed. Lord, help us come together at Beloved to create new bonds and grow the ones that have been planted. Help us hold on to what we have learned today and spread it beyond, for your word is, is so, so powerful. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for your many blessings this school year. It's only halfway through the semester, yet we are already so grateful for the love you have given us and the community you've provided for us, whether that be at Emory or beyond. God, help us be loving and compassionate with all those we encounter. Allow us to radiate peace and tranquility throughout campus and the community. Encourage us to have meaningful conversations and listen actively to truly be there for one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we ask you today to be with us. Some days we look to the world and see despair, but Lord, you are what keeps us going. Your love is truly everything. We lift to you those who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit. Please comfort them and help us to move with compassion to share your love to all, especially those who are suffering. God, we pray for those affected by the recent hurricane and other natural disasters globally. May you bless those impacted with strength and resilience during these times. God, as wars continue around the world, we humbly ask you to look down on the nations engaging and bring mercy and protection to those who are suffering. Bring peace and strength to civilians, hostages, and anyone else who may need it. Your power is truly capable of anything. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, and for the intentions we hold in the quiet of our hearts this morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And I invite you to say the Lord's Prayer aloud with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much, Mehdi. So, welcome and good to see you. So, please let me let us know you are here. We have QR code. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, please scan the QR code and let us know your presence today. Uh, we have no worship next Sunday on October 13th. I mean, we do not prevent you from coming here, but we will not be here, so <laughs> so please take your um, rest or visit your home church or visit any new church. Yeah, so we will resume on October 20th with our pride service. So please have a restful break. Break is for having a break. So please have a break and <laughs> and, and um, let's see again two weeks later and the most important thing is we have worship sunday on november 10th so woohoo so we will have worship like full of music singing or like playing instrument so if you want to play or sing this day let us know and we'd like to invite like as many people as we can so that we can enjoy the day yep Ah, and we also have lunch after the worship, so please join us and make a lot of friends. Okay. Um, let us stand at your ability. Our 
All right, all right. All right, and right before we sing the song, too, what wasn't listed on the program is, or for the announcement on November 16th, it's about a month, a little over a month from now, Voices will be having another fall concert. And I want to invite anybody that hear, heard us this morning that still wants to sing with us. We just launched an entirely new repertoire on Friday night, so you'll be right in time for this concert if you want to join us. We will be rehearsing tomorrow night in, uh, over in the teaching chapel. Uh, you can come anytime between 6 and 8 if you want to join us. All right? Yes, you're invited. Here we go. All right. <laughs> Here we go. Man. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Your voice, you have led Darkest night, you are close like no other. I know you as a father, I know you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life, you have been faithful. remain standing for the blessing, I will read it twice, and I invite you to read it with me the second time through. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that we may work for free justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, injustice, starvation, and war, so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and to turn their joy into pain. Uh, sorry? <laughs> nope, other way around, turn their pain into joy. <laughs> and may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. May God bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, 
so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, injustice, starvation, and war, so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. Amen.